with it. Let's look at that situation on the continental margin of the eastern United States. Here is the coastline. Here is Philadelphia. And up here is New York. You remember we looked at this continental shelf in the first unit when we were discussing the origin of the sedimentary rocks in the Grand Canyon. Then the very broad shelf, the continental slope, and then the deep ocean floor of the Atlantic. In the time of the deposition of the Rocky Mountains, evidently very much of the area was limestone deposited over a broad continental shelf, and the edge was shaly, and the transition between the two, between the limestone and the shale in the Rocky Mountains, must mark the approximate edge of the continental shelf, where the water became deeper and fossils, that is animals and plants, were not able to flourish in the deep water, being out of the reach of light and therefore limestone was not deposited in that area and what we got was shale. Now, you may think that sediments deposited on a continental shelf, shallow water, would only be thin. But in fact, seismic work across a continental shelf, uh, the continental shelf around the eastern United States, reveals that in fact the sediments are very thick. They're thick because apparently the basement on which they were deposited, the granitic kind of basement, of the continental crust is faulted, is broken by normal faults, which constantly slipping downward allow the accumulation of sediment to thicknesses as great as seven kilometers, 7,000 meters, about 20,000 feet of sediment lies beneath the continental shelf of eastern North America. And then the sediment thickens and we meet the ocean floor. I'm sorry, the sediment thins, and we meet the ocean floor. So the kind of situation in which it seems the Rocky Mountains have their beginnings is as sediments on a continental shelf, and the constant down-dropping of the basement on which the sediments were deposited allows them to build up to very considerable thicknesses. And we find, in fact, thicknesses like 20,000 and 30,000 feet of shallow water sediments in mountain belts such as the Rockies and the Appalachians. But that's just a passive situation, the accumulation of sediment getting thicker and thicker and thicker. How do we get from that stage into the mountain belt stage, into the deformation stage? How do we convert that passive kind of continental margin such as we have on the Atlantic into an active continental margin where mountain bolts are built, an active continental margin, for example, like the Andes, like the western coast of South America. How do we get to that stage? Well, you should be able to remember how we get an active margin to a plate by the breaking of a plate. Here, oceanic lithosphere is diving down between beneath another piece of oceanic lithosphere. A break having taken place at this point, this piece having then dived down, producing volcanoes. You remember this situation from plate tectonics and volcanoes. You should know it very well. So let's look at how that happens, or might happen, in the case of the Atlantic continental margin. There is the continental margin as it is today. Here, continent. There, continental shelf very much enlarged in that upper diagram, and here, ocean floor, and beneath it all, mantle. So that's a cross-section of the lithosphere at the edge of an Atlantic-type continental margin, the kind of margin on which the sediments of the Rocky Mountains began their, their history. Now then, let's see what happens to that in order to turn it into an active continental margin. Well. Imagine then that it breaks and begins to descend. And it descends beneath the piece of oceanic lithosphere that was originally joined to it. And an island arc builds up 
Now then, what happens as this piece of oceanic lithosphere continues to dive down, continues to subduct? That island arc, which remember is formed of andesites, gets progressively closer and closer and closer to the continental margin. Well, we can't do it very accurately with plasticine because it doesn't bend enough. But you can see what's going to happen. That island arc is going to collide with the continental margin. Now, of course, once the first island arc has collided with the edge of the continent, if the ocean is to continue to spread from the spreading ridge in the center of the ocean, then another fracture must take, in, take place in the ocean crust. And if that fracture takes place in the same fashion as it had originally, then another island arc will grow, and that island arc will collide with the continent. And in this way, a succession of island arcs can be welded onto the edge of the continent. In this way, continents grow. That's one of the ways. Anyway, another thing can happen, which is indicative of this kind of event at the edge of the continental margin, and that is that the split may result in continental in ocean crust, I'm sorry, being driven onto the continent. It's rather a peculiar thing to happen. Usually what takes place is that the ocean crust dives down, but now and again slabs are in fact driven up onto the continent. And we find that in, for example, the Appalachian Mountains. Now, the collision of the island arcs with the edge of the continent, with the sediments that have been accumulating there on the continental shelf, which is subsiding, leads to the compression of those sediments. So let's go to the squeeze box again, which we looked at in the unit on deformation, and see what deformation of the strata produce this time. Imagine the island arc colliding with the continent. There's a very fine thrust fault developing just here. A slice is being driven over rock which is in fact younger than it. And quite a fine fold which has also begun to, to fracture. There the sand has been thrust right over uh, the strata which is younger than it. Quite a good example of the kind of thing that happens in a mountain belt. Compare it, for example, with the Rockies, the, with the model that we uh, constructed earlier. You can see in the model thrust sheets and folds, very similar to those that we've just produced in the squeeze box. Now, that's a kind of mountain belt we call a collision mountain belt. This, at this time, collision of island arcs with the edge of the continent. Now, if you imagine the ocean continuing to be uh, subducted, continuing to be destroyed at the edge of the, uh, the plate, then it's quite easy to imagine that the two continents on both sides of the ocean can also come together and provide us with another kind of collision. That's the kind of collision which took place between India and Asia. India moving north, colliding with Asia, producing the Himalayas. You probably remember that mountain belt from the plate tectonics program. Another case of a collision mountain belt between two continents is the Alps. And there, the ocean which lay between Africa and Europe is still present. Part of it is still the Mediterranean. That's the ocean that was destroyed as the two continents came together, Africa and Europe. Now, there's a, another kind of mountain belt, which you've also seen in the unit on plate tectonics, which is not caused by collision. And that is the Andes, the Andes on the west coast of South America.